Welcome, I'm Dr Pauline Mackay from the University of Glasgow's Centre for Robert Burns Studies and it's a real privilege to have been asked to host an hour of poetry and conversation with two wonderful writers, Kathleen Jamie and Josephine Bacon. This event is organised by Cove Park and made possible by the collaboration of the Quebec Office in London, Scottish Affairs for Canada and the British Council. So we come together just a few short days after Scotland and thousands of people worldwide have been remembering Robert Burns. Robert Burns is known as the Scottish National Bard. He was born in 1759 in Alloway, Ayrshire to farmer William Burness and Agnes Brown. And he died just 37 years later in Dumfries in 1796. During his short life, he produced an astonishing body of poetry, song, prose and correspondence. Now, part of what makes Burns so popular beyond Scotland is his broad thematic range. And I say it often, but there's something in Burns for everyone to ponder. Another reason that Burns is so widely celebrated in the 21st century, over 200 years after his death, is that a considerable body of his literature is concerned with timeless, universal issues, one, of course, being nature. Burns, with his agricultural roots, was greatly inspired by the natural world and affected by the land, the climate, the changing seasons. In one of Burns's earlier, most famous and oft-quoted poems, To a Mouse on Turning Her Up in Her Nest with the Plough, November 1785. He writes, I'm truly sorry man's dominion has broken nature's social union and justifies that ill opinion which makes thee startle at me, thy poor earth-born companion and fellow mortal. Burns' concern for nature, his awareness, is as significant now as it's ever been. Perhaps more so. I've always been struck by the seeming spontaneity and frequency with which Burns was inspired to compose nature poems and to deploy natural imagery in his many hundreds of poems and songs. Now, this Burns Week... I am joined by two internationally acclaimed 21st century poets, separated by geography and language, but united by the inspiration that they, like Burns, each draw from their natural surroundings, from their environments. Kathleen Jamie is a poet, essayist and editor. In August 2021, she was appointed the Macker or the National Poet for Scotland. She was raised in Curry near Edinburgh and studied philosophy at the University of Edinburgh, publishing her first poems as an undergraduate. Her writing is rooted in Scottish landscape and culture and ranges through travel, women's issues, archaeology and visual art. Kathleen writes in English and occasionally in Scots and she's published many celebrated collections since her first Black Spiders in 1982. Kathleen's selected poems were published in 2018. Josephine Bacon is a poet, director, documentarist, lyricist, translator, storyteller, and Inuimun educator. Josephine is a new and originates from Pesamit. She has achieved global recognition as one of Quebec's seminal writers and she is a great ambassador both in Quebec and internationally for the culture of First Nations. Strongly engaged with First Nations literary and artistic scenes, Josephine inspires young generations to be proud of their First Nations identities and to defend their languages and cultures. Among her many prize-winning collections are Baton à Message, published in 2009, and Yush Kelkapar in 2018. 
So welcome, Kathleen and Josephine. It's a pleasure and a privilege to be speaking with you this evening. Hi. Now, we have some beautiful readings from each of you, especially for tonight. And so if it's fine with you, I'd like to move on to those just now, beginning with Kathleen. And to our audience, please do write any questions or responses for Kathleen and Josephine using the question and answer function on Zoom. And I'll come back to as many as we have time for later on in the evening. So let's hear from Kathleen. Hello, I'm Kathleen Jamie. I'm what's called the Macker, or Scotland's national poet. And it's an absolute pleasure to be with you this Burns night, that other Scottish national poet. Um, Burns, what can we say about Burns? When I was wee, Burns suppers were for men. They involved haggis and whiskey, and they were marked by tradition. But in recent years, this tradition has evolved and it now embraces not just Burns Night, there's Burns Day, and it looks like we're heading for a Burns Week. And happily, more and more people are becoming involved with this. Children, female people, nature admiring people. Burns is being held, oh well, put it another way, I've heard Burns named as Scotland's original nature poet in the way that he could and did address other creatures, mice, flowers, what have you and lived very closely to their, their concerns. Nothing could be more relevant to our own day. So I am going to embrace that and bring you some poems of my own, which concern Burns in the fact that one is written in Scots, um, the rest are in English, and that they also embrace, advocate for, notice the natural world. What could be more relevant? So I'll start with a poem in Scots called Spring. Spring. The hailstones broch by this northern blast, burl with the petals, the same wind scalp, the green trees and the sleighs. There, spring stang, flourish and hail, small wreaths at the gutters, sang gain, sang gain. Are we done, my old Joe? No, flash me thon gladiated glance again, the inner mind fine. Among the leaves so green -o. Now, I'll just dash through that in English, if you like. It's very simple. Spring. The hailstones brought by this northern wind spin with the petals the same wind has scaled, poured. What's the word? Scaled? <laughs> well, um, spilled. Spilled, yes. Sorry. <laughs> Spring, the hailstones brought by this northern blast spin with the petals the same wind has spilled from the cherry trees and the blackthorn. There, the sting of spring, blossom and hail, small wreaths at the gutters, soon gone, soon gone. Are we finished, my old lover? No, gave me that glad glance again, the one I remember well among the leaves so greeno. This next poem I wrote during, oh, it was almost a year ago to the day, actually. It was, we were deep in winter again and in lockdown for, for COVID. And we weren't supposed to be going out much and we weren't supposed to be seeing each other. And it was dark and it was wintry and things were getting a bit on top of me. And I, I spent the morning crying, thinking I would never see my children again, which, of course, was nonsense. Children are adults and have their own lives. But there, that's where I was. But I forced myself to go out and up the hill to a particular tree that I know. And I forced myself to make some, not a poem, that would be too much, but just some phrases. I wrote down these phrases and then arranged them when I came back in this way. It's an unusual layout. But once it was done, I thought, oh, I've rebalanced it. This is a balancing act and I've rebalanced my own mind. The poem is called Lone Tree. Trudging again. To lone tree lookout, high on the grasslands of Sparrow Craig Hill, pallid winter sunshine enlivens the skyline, scarves of mist wander the strath below. No sparrows, just a crow cawing from a pylon, fox turds by a tussock, pin sized bones. There you wait, crooked elder of the pasture. I step inside your shadow 
outstretched on shallow snow. Our two forms merge, my lungs breathe within you. May a missile thrush sing high in my branchy mind. <clears throat> That was a, 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 a private poem in the sense I didn't write it for any reason other than my own. My next is very much a public poem. You probably know that the, the COP26 summit was held here in Scotland last November. It was held in Glasgow. And when it ended, I think with many, many other people, I felt that nothing had been resolved. I don't know what I'd hoped for, but I felt that it hadn't been achieved. And... I felt there was an, I don't like the word closure, but I felt we needed something, something to resolve this thing. And I was thinking about the River Clyde that flows through Glasgow, ex-industrial river, and it occurred to me, what, what would the Clyde think about what had just happened on its banks? So this poem is what, it's called What the Clyde Said After COP26. I keep the heed. I'm cool. If asked, but you never ask, I'd answer in tongues, hinting of limbs, of leaving, nothing, Kelvin, cart, but neutral, balancing both banks equally as I flow. Do I judge? I mind the hammer swing, the welder's flash, the heavy steel-built hulls I bore downstream from my city. And maybe I was a blatherskite then, a wee bit full of myself when we seemed guy near unstoppable. But how can I stomach any more of these storm rains? How can I slip quietly away to meet my lover, the wide-armed ocean, knowing I'm a poisoned chalice she must drain, drinking everything you chuck away? So these days, I'm a listener, aye. Think of me as a long, level, liquid ear gliding slowly by. I heard the world's words, the pleas of peoples born where my ships once sailed. I heard the beautiful promises. And sure, I'm a river, but I can take a side. From this day, I'd rather keep afloat like wee folded paper boats, the hopes of the young folk chanting at my bank, fear in their spring bright eyes. So hear this, fail them and I will rise. Thank you. I'd give a flavour of the kind of, of kind of work that I do. As I say, um, as with Josephine, we're very much engaged with the natural world and our different uh, responses and reactions to it and the need nowadays to advocate for the natural world because it can't speak for itself. So I believe it's the job of the poets to step in and begin to do that. I'm old enough to remember life before the internet when this would have been, and still is, absolutely extraordinary. I can sit here in the Poetry Library in Edinburgh and communicate with you in I can communicate with anybody on the planet without leaving Scotland. This is extraordinary. And I think, I hope the pandemic, which has revealed this to us, I hope that we can keep doing this. I hope that we can fly less, frankly, you know, because we now understand the damage that we're doing. But here we are, speaking to each other. I hope we can continue this. I'm lo looking forward so much to, to speaking with you properly. This is pre-recorded. I'll speak with you live shortly. How miraculous is that? And to hearing work from Josephine Bacon. Thank you so much for that, Kathleen. Um, it was wonderful. And there's some great responses to it in the chat as well. Um, your last poem gave sort of goosebumps. So there you and me, I must say me too. Um, so I have a few questions for you just now, just before we move on. And again, to our audience, if you have any questions for Kathleen or Josephine throughout the night, please put them in the question and answer. But you pointed out, Kathleen, um, that we're having, we are having this conversation mere weeks after COP26 was held in Scotland in Glasgow. And it's fair to say that this, the UN's climate change conference you know, as frustrating as it was for many, yourself included, gave rise to a wealth of creative endeavour. And it also brought into even sharper focus um, existing creative and poetic responses to nature, climate change and environmental crisis. 
You mentioned that you feel it's the job of a poet to advocate for the natural world. And you've certainly you know, made this a central concern of your work. So what I'd like to ask is, how important is literature in inspiring people to take individual action? Is, it part, is this part of what inspires you? And where do you see your own work in this landscape? I know that's a very broad question. So a lot of questions in there. <laughs> Get away, Kathleen. Let's let's see where we end up. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Let, let me try and wind back to the beginning of that. Um, I I think you said that I saw poetry as as um as having a job to do. Yeah. I, I'm conflicted around this. I don't want to believe that poetry needs to be recruited to any other cause. Poetry should be its own thing, you know, and it's not the job of poetry to fulfill any other agenda. Yeah. Having said that, I also think that the situation we're in now as a species is so serious that we need all hands on deck. And that must include the poets as well as everybody else. And um, given a choice, um, I think we have... A, poetry can do a job, it's not the job of poetry, but it's one of the many jobs that poetry can do, put it that way, uh, is, is to advocate, is to um, exhort, is to encourage people just to notice, you know, what's, what's going on around about them and reflect and use language that way. So um, did that answer any of, of what you asked me there? Oh, absolutely, yeah. And is this something that's inspired you or um, is this something that you're aware of when you're composing your poetry, poetry that really is inspired by the natural world mm -hmm. or um, not in all cases? Um, where do you see your work in this particular landscape? Um, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm the last one to know what effect my work has. You know, I, I sit here in this very room usually you know, everything about with words on pieces of paper and and then they go and have their own life. And I can't tell when they leave this room what that life is going to be. The poem I just read, the one about the Clyde, had the most extraordinary week on, on social media. I was astonished by it. Yeah. Never had a reception like that before. Yes. I must have spoken to a lot of people. But um, sitting here mucking about with, with little pieces of paper, things scribbled on them, I truly don't know what effect they're going to have, and I can't make them have an effect. You know, they have to look after themselves in the world. Yeah. Um, so, I, I, I think poetry can be of use because it's the only art form I can think of which can speak to other creatures, which is always addressed to other creatures and apostrophized to other creatures as Burns themselves did there, you know? And also we can speak as other creatures, give them voice. And I think um, it's, it's a unique function of poetry to be able to do that. I find it fascinating trying to think my way into another creature, be it a flower or a tree or whatever, and, and allow it to speak, you know, with, with grace and respect and a, and a hint of humour and think, what would these creatures say? As I say, that's, that's a thing that poetry can do. And one I find particularly interesting. So, no, that's great. Thank you, Kathleen. And actually, it's really interesting for me to hear you explain that and describe that because, as you know, I'm a literary critic. And, you know, I've been researching Robert Burns for some time. I can't ask him these questions. <laughs> and to understand um, the sort of the inspiration and the processes and to hear you speak about them is really valuable for me and certainly for a lot of people in the audience if we're looking at the chat. Um, before we, and we'll all come back to these questions, but before we move on, um, I felt it was really powerful to hear you read Lone Tree and to explain the circumstances that led to its composition. You know, it was, it was clearly a very spontaneous, you know, almost organic, if I can use that word, um, moment. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about that and the extent to which, for you, even if you don't want to um, broaden it out, um, poetry and nature can be a catalyst for rebalancing or healing? I think I would say again that it's not the job of poetry to, to heal. 
as it's not the job of poetry to, to act, you know, be an activist thing, but it, it can be those as well because it's such a broad, staunchly broad art form. And, and that poem, The Lone Tree, I, I think I, I tried to show how it was laid on the paper. Yeah. So it was like a, a, a yoke, you know, balanced there. That was a purely private exercise. I thought to myself, I'm not going to make myself write a poem because that never works. You know, I would say to myself, today I'm going to write a poem, nothing happens. So I took myself up to this, this tree on the hill and made myself look. You mentioned the word inspiration a few times. To, to be honest with you, I don't believe in inspiration. I believe in attention. I believe in looking and listening. And what comes to me comes through my senses rather than some strange book. <laughs> so I told myself, I'm going to go on this, stop crying, stop being ridiculous, get out of the house, go for a walk, take a pen and a piece of paper and just write down eight phrases. That's what I told myself, a wee exercise. And then I wrote down these phrases thinking, now this is a bit simple, isn't it? But try not to judge. And when I got home, I realised as I was messing about with them, they were falling into this pattern. And when it was over, I thought, oh, my goodness, look at that. They, they, they want to balance. And maybe that's what I'm trying to do, just to restore some equilibrium in my own mind. So I recommend it to folks if they're feeling a bit you know, strung out. Thank you so much. Those were really, really full and illuminating answers. So very grateful to you. Um, we'll come back and to ask you some of the questions that are in the Q&A just in shortly but I'd like to bring Josephine into the discussion at this point in time. Hello Josephine, a privilege to speak with you this evening and of course we're going to hear your readings in just a moment but I wonder whether you would like to share some of your own thoughts about how poetry and nature can be whether or not you feel that poetry nature can be a catalyst for rebalancing or healing? For me, the nature or the terre, I feel that the terre needs de poésie to be consoled by the human beings. He needs to write écrire à la terre c'est de lui dire à, à quel point on le respecte en tant qu'humain, parce que quand on regarde tout ce qui se passe aujourd'hui, on, on manque beaucoup de respect à la planète. Alors, quand on lui écrit, quand on lui parle avec des mots poèmes, c'est un peu, c'est le prendre un peu dans ses bras. Moi, la poésie... Tu, tu, Moi, la poésie, ça m'est venu tard dans mon âge, et, mais j'ai toujours écrit finalement. Mais pour moi, la poésie, j'aime m'adresser à la toundra, à la terre. J'aime m'adresser aux quatre éléments, tu vois, à l'air, au feu, à l'eau, tu sais, puis, puis surtout à la planète. Et puis, tu sais, de lui dire à quel point j'ai besoin d'elle pour survivre. Thank you. That's, that's a wonderful answer. And I think it's really going to help people just appreciate your, your poetry when we hear it in just a moment. And I'd like to ask um, if we could play your poems. Um, and before I do, thank you to Josephine's team for sending the recordings and sincere thanks also to the Scottish Poetry Library for um, recording Kathleen. So, I'm so looking forward to hearing this. Let's begin with Josephine's The Nord Manterpel, The North Calls to Me from Baton à Message, or Message Sticks. And Josephine reads this poem in French and then in English. Le Nord m'interpelle. Ce départ nous mène vers d'autres directions aux couleurs des quatre nations, blanche, l'eau, jaune, le feu, rouge, la colère, noir, 
cet inconnu où réfléchit le mystère. Cela fait des années que je ne calcule plus. Ma naissance ne vient pas d'un baptême, mais d'un seul mot. Sommes-nous si loin de la montagne à gravir nos sœurs de l'Est, de l'Ouest, du Sud et du Nord chantent-elles l'incantation qui les guérira de la douleur meurtrière de l'identité Notre race se relèvera-t-elle de l'abîme de sa passion Je dis aux chaînes du cercle, libérez les rêves. Comblez les vies inachevées. Poursuivez le courant de la rivière dans ce monde multiple. Accommodez le songe. Le passage d'hier à demain devient aujourd'hui l'unique parole de ma sœur, la terre. Seul le tonnerre absout une vie vécue. The North calls to me. This living takes us in other direction with the color of the four nations. White, water, yellow, fire, red, anger, black that unknown that reflects mystery. It's been years since I stopped counting. My birth does not come from a baptism, but from a single word. Are we so far from the mountain to be climbed? Our sisters of the East, the West, the South, and the North, do they chant the incantation that will heal them of the deadly pain of identity? Will our people rise again from the abyss, from the abyss of its passion? I say to the chain of the cycle, free the dreams, fulfill the unfinished lives, follow the current of the river in this multiple world, make room for dreaming. The passage from yesterday to tomorrow becomes Today, the only words of my sister, the land, only, only thunder absolves a life lived. Thank you so much for that, Josephine. Um, such an emotive poem. Can you give us some insight into your thoughts and inspirations as you compose this poem and tell us why you've chosen it for tonight's gathering? Uh, je l'ai choisi surtout pour les femmes, pour les femmes assassinées, tuées, pour les enfants disparus et pour toutes les, 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 les nations où existe la, la douleur, le chagrin, la tristesse, c'est que quelque part, tu vois, le rêve existe. Et, et puis il faut s'accrocher à, à son rêve pour pouvoir continuer à se soigner, à se guérir, et puis quelque part arriver à se pardonner et à pardonner aussi à d'autres qui, qui parfois nous amènent des sentiments de tristesse. 
pour moi, les femmes sont très, très importantes chez les Inuits. La femme Inuit, tu sais, autrefois, pendant le nomadisme, était le pilier de, la, de son clan. C'était toute la langue venait d'elle, l'identité, c'est elle qui te le donnait. Et puis, tout, euh, euh, tout son clan avait besoin d'elle pour que tout, que tout puisse continuer dans l'harmonie avec la terre, dans l'harmonie avec tous les éléments et puis, euh, et puis être en, en harmonie aussi avec les esprits que, qui, qui nous entourent. T'sais, quand on sait écouter, on sait que les arbres nous parlent. Et puis quand tu apprends ça, on apprenait ça très très jeune, à savoir écouter et puis à savoir entendre que tous ces éléments nous protègent et nous mettent en garde aussi si on dépasse ce qu'il ne faut pas dépasser. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Such a, a powerful testimony to those women and certainly made even more poignant by being able to hear from yourself um, what, what the meaning is in this. And um, the part, of course, that, that this plays in nature as well, in nature plays as well. Um, we have, of course, another reading from you, Josephine, a Nuit Blanche, a white night from Un Thé dans la Tundra, a tea in the tundra. And Josephine reads this poem in Inu Amun and then in French. So before we proceed with our discussion, I think it would, people would love to hear your second poem. Nani Beben, Vihagwan, the Port of Vegan. Egane Banoti Abu Abmata Tamatena Mata Nyam Tai Mte Pedapa Wapatum, it was a mote On one is potentum Tamanotne Ehmino Green Wapti come what stubborn to see that then is but a scumagat is to see. If met stay dabbin was to me no unhead you. Wapshi no, he pay one no, but a mane no. Don't know what. Stay Tinan Kabwatata Nan Twente Menegastiji in you ya Tree Nastor Matin Tano de Cheiko ya Une nuit blanche Les heures, les minutes, les secondes n'ont jamais été si proches de moi. Dans ton invisible, un souffle, ta présence. Tu es là sans être là. Un lever du jour reçoit tes premiers pas. Premier respect, tu acceptes ta destinée. Assis sur le lichen, l'immensité de la terre détient. Tu lèves la tête, des aurores boréales, 
des anges blancs, verts, mauves, te prennent sous leurs ailes, puis t'amènent là où tu resteras vivant. L'écho murmure un chant ancien. Je prends le tambour. Je cherche une perceuse que je ne sais pas chanter. Tu es mon rêve long. Je m'en dis des années pour te connaître. Mes rides n'ont plus d'âge. Again, thank you so much, Josephine. Um, deeply affecting readings of your work and the, the natural imagery in particular in that one really, really struck me. And um, I wanted to ask you, um, and if you could touch a little bit on this poem, but I understand that more generally for you, writing about nature is very deeply associated with your traditions and your culture. And I wondered if you could say a little bit more about that. Euh, mon Dieu, euh, beaucoup d'années dans ma vie, j'ai enregistré les aînés, j'ai enregistré, je les ai traduits, je les ai transcrits. Ma, ma première poésie m'est venue d'eux. Ils ont été les, les, premiers, les premiers poètes qui m'ont inspiré. Et puis quand, quand je les traduisais et que je les enregistrais, ben, leurs mots venaient toujours de la terre. Comme je disais tout à l'heure, toute, toute cette juste savoir que quand tu marches, quand on entend les pas sur la neige avec les raquettes, c'est le même battement que leur cœur. Et puis quand ils jouaient le tambour, il fallait qu'ils l'harmonisent avec les battements de, la cœur, de leur cœur. Donc pour moi, écrire, il n'y a pas plus beau poésie, je trouve, que ce que la terre nous inspire. Et, et, et les mots des aînés, autant les, 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 les hommes que les, tu sais, que les femmes âgées, parce que toute leur vie, toute leur vie, c'est la terre qui prenait soin d'eux. S'il n'y avait pas eu la terre et tout ce qui, et tout ce qui, en terre, qui entoure la terre, tu sais, nous n'existerions pas. C'est parce que la terre nous a acceptés, a accepté nos premiers pas. Il a accepté tu sais, de, 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 de nous nourrir, de prendre soin de nous, de nous soigner et de nous donner une identité, de nous donner une langue. C'est pour ça, que je pense, que nous existons. Sinon, que ferions-nous s'il n'y avait pas s'il n'y avait pas tout ça qui nous, a, qui nous a été offert par les grands esprits, par tous les maîtres des animaux Tu vois, tu sais, quand tu es chasseur, il faut t'adresser soit au maître du caribou, au maître des animaux aquatiques, au maître des animaux qui ont des ailes, au maître des animaux qui te gardent au chaud. Donc, tu sais, tout ça, tout ça nous a été, tu sais, nous a été offert. Aujourd'hui, tu sais, quand je regarde ce qu'on fait subir à la terre, on creuse des trous, on dévie les rivières, on coupe les arbres. Tu sais, que, comment tu veux, comment, tu sais, que, comment la terre va-t-il respirer si on, nous n'entendons plus parler des arbres, si on n'écoute plus tu sais, le, 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 le courant des rivières. Et puis, s'il n'y a pas de lac ou des sources pour nous abreuver. Tu sais, tu sais la toundra, c'est un terre dénudée. Mais, tu sais, mais c'est une terre où, tu sais, le, 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 tu sais, c'est à cet endroit que la terre reconnaît tes pas quand tu marches. C'est ça, moi, moi, ma poésie, 
elle vient de là, tu sais, de, la, de, de la poésie des aînés, tu sais, de la poésie de, 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 tout ce que je, de tout ce que je vois autour de moi, tu sais, autant en, en haut, autant, tu sais, autant dans toutes les directions du nord, du sud, de l'est, de l'ouest. Tu sais, je je, je n'ai qu'à regarder dans une direction, il y aura toujours un poème qui me sera offert. Thank you so much. And um, Kathleen, I think I'd like to bring, bring you back into the conversation at this point. Um, I'm sure it's been quite um, interesting for each of you to hear one another's work and to hear one another explain your work. And um, I just wonder if, um, Kathleen, you recognise any of what Josephine just said in your own sort of spontaneous responses at times when you're paying attention, as you say, rather than waiting for any sort of divine inspiration. I thought that was really interesting because again, if we're in Burns, Burns was all about this sort of divine inspiration. And again, it's really great for me to hear people speak so really frankly about how they consider their poetry as sort of what it springs from. So I don't know if you'd like to come in here, Kathleen. Well, I've, I've been taking notes as, as <laughs> that I have, I have written Consoled, speaking to earth, addressing the tundra. We should be able to dream, to heal. We, um, we need to speak to the animals. It's an act of listening. And that this business of, of listening, I think, is, is of where we have a communion, I think. When I was a young poet, um, I believed and was led to believe that writing poetry was all about voice. It was me and my voice. And the older I get, the more I think, no, it's not about me and my voice. It's about listening and enabling the voices of other creatures and other, um, you know, other life forms. And I think we, Josephine and I could have a communion there. She has this astonishing cultural background, which I feel I don't have, you know, or it's so many generations lost to me that it's difficult to recover. She's much more closer to that. So I have the task of, of trying to uncover how it is, how to listen, you know, how to speak to the earth, how to listen to the earth speaking to me. And I'm astonished that I can actually say that now without embarrassment. 20 years ago, I couldn't have said that, but, but now we can because, oh, Josephine's laughing, because it's, it's urgent. You know? So I want to come and sit on that sofa with Josephine there and listen to her. <laughs> you should set up another call <laughs> that's the wonder of zoom isn't it because something like this would just have been it would have been not impossible but it wouldn't even have occurred to us before the pandemic which is another thing both of you have briefly touched on now there's so many questions from the audience and I'm aware that time is marching on so there's one thing that I think it's important to address and it's been you know there's so many people comment on how wonderful it is to hear you recite your poetry in, in different languages. You each write in multiple languages. Kathleen in English and Scots, Josephine in um, French and Inu. So what does it mean to you as poets, and you might want to discuss this, or um, to be able to use that linguistic range that you have to really bring to life or drive home the, the central concerns of your work, or is it not as determined as that? Can Josephine begin to answer that one? Yeah, Josephine. Uh, pour moi, c'est très important pour moi d'écrire dans ma langue, parce que quand j'écris dans ma langue, c'est pas une traduction pour une traduction. Ce que j'écris, parce que tu sais, la plupart des, des poèmes que j'écris sont d'abord écrits en Inno Aimo. Alors, quand je, suis, quand, je suis contente, quand je suis contente du poème que j'ai écrit, je le regarde puis je le ressens. Alors, j'essaie de le transposer dans la langue de l'autre pour qu'il puisse vivre un peu ce que je vis dans ma langue. Donc, c'est très important. Parce que, tu sais, Aimo, est une langue poétique déjà. Parce qu'un seul mot, 
peut, un seul mot en Inuaimu est une phrase complète. Avec le verbe sujet et complément. Donc pour moi, tu vois, quand je vais chercher, quand, tu sais, quand je pense à la toundra, quand je pense aux rivières, quand je pense aux montagnes, c'est naturel pour moi que la, la première langue qui me vient soit l'Inouaïmou. Parce que je, mes origines sont là. Tu sais, je, tu sais, mes premiers pas appartiennent tu sais, à, 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 à la toundra, tu sais, à, à Noutmet. À, à mes premiers pas, tu sais, ça, ils appartiennent à la forêt. Tu sais, quand je pagaille, tu sais, je pagaille sur une rivière, je m'abreuve à une source. Et puis quand je regarde tu sais, en l'air, c'est les aurores boréales que je vois et puis les étoiles en imaginant que ces étoiles brillent, brillent un peu pour moi. Thank you so much. Kathleen, would you like to come in here? Well, yes, I, I, um, my relationship with, with Scots is very different um, in that I'm only now at, at this great age starting to think about it and try to develop it as a, a language for my poetry because I've been writing poetry in English with a few Scots words for a long time but I always wanted to explore it more and you know you, you, you're, a, you're a Scot Pauline you understand we have difficulties around the language because it's so it is close to English mm -hmm. so when we were small children we were told speak proper English just speak properly if you want to get a job speak good English you know And even to the extent, of course, that, that we were punished for, for speaking Scots in school. So only now am I trying to develop it, trying to read in it, trying to look at the old dictionaries, which we're not allowed to do, you know, and, and, and develop a poetic language in it. It may succeed, it may not, but it's what I'm um, trying to teach myself to do just now. So making a few little lyrics in, in Scots is, is new for me. So it's not the language, although my granny spoke a good Scots, it's not the deep language of my childhood as um, Josephine's inner language is for her. Mine was a mixed up thing. It's, it's remarkable just to hear that there are obviously um, resonances with both of your work that we've discussed tonight, but also such differences in your approaches that it's just made for such a fascinating conversation. And I do want to give the audience a chance to ask a few questions. So I will share this one from um, Claire. So Claire says, thank you for such wonderful readings. I'd like to ask both poets, Do you have any favourite eco poets that you find yourself returning to read for solace or for strength during these ecologically unbalanced times? Would you like to begin, Josephine? Si j'ai des, si des poètes que je dis qui, sont, qui parlent beaucoup d'écologie, si j'ai bien compris, c'est ça. Est-ce que c'est ça? OK. <rire> Mon Dieu, tu sais, euh, tu vois, il y a, y a un poète breton que j'aime beaucoup, tu sais, qui, qui, a écrit un, un, qui a écrit un livre qui s'appelle « En suivant Chimon », tu sais, parce qu'elle elle a vécu dans l'intérieur des terres ce qu'on appelle le Noudmut, et puis à travers ce vieux chasseur et ses deux filles, et, elle a été, et, elle, a, elle, a, elle a vécu l'écologie comme, tu sais, comme elle doit être. Donc, euh, tous ceux qui, des poètes, tous les poètes qui parlent, tu sais, de, 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 de la terre, de, 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 de tous les éléments, de tous les éléments, tu sais, de, de, j'ai beaucoup d'admiration. C'est que quand on n'oublie pas où nous sommes, tout poète, je pense, réfléchit toujours 
où il, où il est quand il écrit ses mots. Tout poète mérite d'être lu, selon moi, qu'il soit écologiste, qu'il soit... Chaque poète a des mots à dire. Donc, chaque poète est, vaut la peine d'être lu. I could not agree more with you, Josephine. <laughs> and uh, Kathleen. Well, I think, I think like Josephine, I, 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 I don't know how to answer. You, know. yeah. you can see a fraction of my bookshelves from here. <laughs> yes. I don't consider myself well-read. <laughs> oh, no, I think that's a, still quite an impressive bookshelf. <laughs> no, that's a tiny amount. I, I, I don't, I just, I cannot keep up with the amount of, of books and poetry that, that is published. So it's a constant renewal and a constant discovery. And sometimes you can discover something that's 300 years old or something that was published last week, you know. And I do, I must admit, I, do, I, I am getting interested increasingly in the First Nations poets of, of North America, you know, Canada and, and USA. So there's a whole new world opening up. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, speaking of a whole new world, Angela asks Kathleen, are you planning to pass on some of your writing skills to upcoming Scottish writers and poets online? <laughs> I, think, I think we've had quite an astonishing instruction in the art of poetry this evening, that's for sure. I have nothing planned. Um, I did teach for, for a long time, but um, gave up my, my teaching job a year and a half ago. So maybe after this MACA thing finishes, I'll be able to, to get back into that. What I would not want to lose is contact with young people. However, however it um, manifests itself, you know, so I'm going to try to find ways of, of working with youngsters again. Whether I teach them or they teach me is, is immaterial, but I want to keep that contact. Wonderful. Um, we have a comment in the, the chat that I think both of you might quite like to hear, and it's from, I think, Victor. Or Victoria, I'm not sure. I can't quite see the full name. And it says, I think both Kathleen and Josephine have demonstrated a profound empathy with nature, identifying with it. And perhaps this is the function of poetry, not an equal preach, but a gentle incentive to integrate and so appreciate. Yeah. To integrate. Mm -hmm. Go with that. Yeah, I think the, 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 the did you mention we're preaching? I think the, the activist thing makes me quail a little bit because I don't want to be on, on a soapbox telling people how to behave, telling them to mend their ways. You know, it is more to be, as, as Josephine says, an act of listening, you know, and giving voice rather than. Although yeah. sometimes you do want to stand on the rooftops and say, just, <laughs> can we just stop? Yeah. I think that both of your work is extremely um, interesting, influential, beautifully nuanced. And it's been a real pleasure to hear both of you read your work, but also to hear you talk about it and describe it for us all and you know we'll make sure that you see the the comments that we have here but um i'm very grateful and i know that the audience is as well and it's now about time to to draw the evening to a close and it remains for me to prefer my sincere thanks to kathleen kathleen jamie and josephine back on very grateful to you. Um, I have learned so much. I would also like to thank the audience for joining us, for your, for your comments, for your commentary in the chat. And as I've said, we'll make sure that um, we send this on to Josephine and Kathleen and also for your questions. And I'd also like to thank the event organizers to Cove Park, the Quebec office in London, Scottish Affairs for Canada and the British Council. And thank you also to Josephine's team 
and to the Scottish Poetry Library for providing those wonderful recordings, which just were such a treat for everyone. So all that remains for me to say now is good afternoon, Josephine, and good evening, Kathleen. So I remembered, I didn't remember in any of the rehearsals, but I've finally cottoned on to the time difference just in time for us to say goodbye. Thank you so much. Well. Thank you.